For most of society, the act of parricide, or the killing of one's parents or other close relatives, is one of the most heinous things a person can do. When these crimes occur, they quickly become high profile, making it seem like parricide is something which happens frequently. Thankfully, FBI data proves that this kind of crime makes up only a small portion of the murders taking place in the US on a yearly basis. But nonetheless, they do happen, as unimaginable to some as that may be. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two horrifying cases of parricide. But first, I'd like to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring today's episode. If you're a faithful true crime fanatic, chances are you've heard discussions around the web about Magellan TV, the number one source for the best and most original true crime content available on Earth. You know about their well-crafted documentaries and brilliant television shows, and how they expand past just true crime to deliver unbelievable outlooks into other subjects like science or culture or the paranormal. In other words, there is always something to binge, no matter what you're interested in. And for our part, we found a show this week that made us fall in love with Magellan TV all over again. This week, we want to highlight the true crime series Lady Killers with Martina Cole, a six-part television show giving us a richly detailed lesson covering some of the most spine-chilling killers who identified as women. When we think of the most famous killers in history, we think of Jeffrey Dahmer or Jack the Ripper, usually leaving behind gruesome crime scenes with devilish backstories and multiple victims. But what if we told you the less discussed female serial killers were just as interesting as their male counterparts? That's one of our favorite aspects of this documentary, how it doesn't try to glorify these killers because of their gender, but how gender can play a role in sociopathic development. It also makes viewers think deeper about the history of gender roles and how we are all vulnerable to emotional and physical abuse. It's the perfect mix of true crime and history, exactly how we curate some of our own videos on Cold Case Detective. Lady Killers with Martina Cole is also a new release, part of Magellan TV's 15 to 20 hours of brand new content they add to their library every week, always leaving fans of true crime and other relevant topics with something fresh to enjoy. So follow the link in the description to access a free month trial and jump into the blood-curdling history of Lady Killers and other top-notch television shows on Magellan TV. You won't regret it. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. Diane and Alan Johnson. In Bellevue, Idaho, on the morning of September 2nd, 2003, at around 6.20 a.m., 16-year-old Sarah Marie Johnson was awoken from her sleep by the sound of a gunshot. Startled, she looked out into the hall and called for her parents, but got no response. A moment later, she heard another shot. In fear, Sarah fled the scene and went to her neighbor's house, begging them to call the police as she explained hysterically that an intruder had shot her parents. When the police arrived at the Bellevue home, they were met with a grisly scene. Diane Johnson, who worked as a tax collector and had a passion for cooking, had been shot once in the head while she was sleeping. She was still under the covers in her bed. Alan Johnson, a landscaper, had been shot twice in the chest and he was lying on the floor next to the bed. He had been showering when he was shot. The shower was still running, and there were blood splatters on the door and tiles. On the floor of the ensuite bathroom was a .264 caliber Winchester rifle. As the family believed they lived in a safe neighborhood, the doors were never locked. This meant that there were no signs of forced entry, and inside the home, there were no signs of a struggle. Investigators turned their attention to the guest house, which was rented out to a 45-year-old man named Mel Spiegel. Although Spiegel was nowhere to be seen, the scope of the Winchester rifle was found on his bed. The weapon was quickly identified as belonging to the tenant, who was found to have already left town at the time of the murders. 
As authorities locked down the streets, they made sure to turn away the garbage truck that had begun its rounds, so it couldn't collect the trash from the bin outside the Johnson's home, nor anyone else's on the street. Inside the Johnson's bin, investigators recovered a pink dressing gown, one latex glove, and one leather glove. Upon speaking with other family members, the police were made aware of 16-year-old Sarah's strained relationship with her parents. This was because they had forbidden her from seeing 19-year-old Bruno Santos, her boyfriend, who was an illegal immigrant from Mexico. In the days before the murders, Diane and Alan had threatened to have Santos charged with statutory rape, which would have seen him deported back to his home country if he didn't stay away from their daughter. As a result of this information, investigators turned their attention to Santos, believing that he could be the one behind the crime. Officers described Santos as cocky and confrontational when they interviewed him. During the questioning, the 19-year-old revealed that he had asked Sarah to marry him and that she'd said yes. Authorities felt that this gave Santos even more reason to want the Johnsons dead, as they would never let Sarah go through with the marriage. However, by this time, Family members of the Johnsons were growing wary of the 16-year-old, who did not appear to be grieving at all. In fact, she was more preoccupied with socializing and getting her hair and nails done than she was with mourning her loved ones. And Diane's sister noticed that she seemed to get annoyed at the mention of her parents. After telling their suspicions to the authorities, investigators began looking into Sarah as a potential suspect. As she used to clean the guest house for Spiegel on a regular basis, she would have known about the guns kept there. Diane's sister recalled that Sarah had asked for the key to the gun safe the day before the murders. When Sarah was brought in for questioning, investigators noticed the inconsistencies in her story. She told police that her bedroom door was closed at the time of the murders, but forensic evidence showed it would have been open, and so would the door to her parents' room. Furthermore, examination of the pink dressing gown found in the bin showed that there were hundreds of tiny blood splatter droplets on the back of the garment, as if someone had worn it back to front during the crime. Sarah's t-shirt, which she wore on the morning of the events, was also analyzed, and its fibers were matched to those found on the dressing gown. The latex glove recovered from the bin contained only the DNA of the 16-year-old, while both the leather glove and the robe had gunshot residue on them. Additionally, Sarah had bruising to her shoulder when she was first questioned following the murders, consistent with the injury one might sustain from the recoil of a rifle. Finally, it was found that the teenager had worn a shower cap to protect her hair. Thus, she had no blood on her when she went to the home of her neighbor. The cap had been flushed down the toilet and was found by plumbers a few weeks later after it caused clogging problems. In October of 2003, just one month after the slayings, Sarah Johnson was charged with two counts of murder, and she was charged as an adult. The prosecution and investigators believed that Sarah had thought she could use her parents' life insurance money and her inheritance to provide herself and her boyfriend a good life. Santos testified at the trial that the 16-year-old had told him how much she hated her father and had spoken about shooting him because he didn't like or approve of the couple's relationship. On March 16th of 2005, Sarah was found guilty on both charges and sentenced to two concurrent life sentences without parole. A further 15 years were added to the sentence as she was also convicted of a firearm enhancement charge. In 2012, Sarah's lawyers filed a petition for a new trial, stating that she had received ineffective legal counsel during the trial. The petition also noted the absence of blood splatter on the then teenager and that the fingerprints on the murder weapon did not match Sarah's or Spiegel's, but another renter named Christopher Hill, who apparently did not have an alibi for the night of the killings, but who was ruled out of the investigation anyway by law enforcement. Sarah's lawyers claimed that her first attorneys should have requested a delay to gather more evidence and did not adequately cross-examine 15 witnesses. However, in 2014, this request was denied. Then in 2017, Sarah tried to get her life sentence reduced, but the sentence was upheld. Diane and Alan's son, Matthew, who was at university at the time of the attacks, spoke at the trial, saying, quote, I lost the two best friends I ever had. Judge, I would like to see the maximum sentence, because after tomorrow, 
I don't want to have to hear about her or this event ever again. I feel she has no remorse and she would do it again. Sarah Marie Johnson is currently still serving time at the Pocatello Women's Correctional Center. Joel and Lisa Guy. Saturday, November 26th, 2016, started like any other day for Joel and Lisa Guy. Together for 31 years, the couple resided in Knoxville, Tennessee, and were in the middle of selling their property on Golden View Lane so that they could move to Sagoinsville, where they planned to retire. Joel, 61, worked as a pipeline engineering designer. His wife, 55-year-old Lisa, worked in HR at Jacobs Engineering in the city of Oak Ridge. She had spent much of her life as a homemaker, but one of Joel's daughters later testified that she, quote, only worked to give her paycheck to her son, Joel Jr. 28-year-old Joel Jr. was born in 1988. He graduated from the Louisiana School for Math, Science, and Arts in 2006 after attending Hanville High School. In the decades since completing his first university course, Joel Jr. had spent one semester at George Washington University before attending Louisiana State. He had reportedly never worked a day in his life and was financially supported by his parents. In 2016, he was living in Baton Rouge, apparently studying to become a plastic surgeon. As Lisa and Joel Sr. had decided to retire, they also planned to stop financially supporting their son. They had told his siblings that it was time for him to stand on his own two feet. In Joel Jr.'s trial later on, the prosecution would argue that this withdrawal of support is what triggered his decision to kill his parents. That Saturday, in November of 2016, Lisa headed out to Walmart to do some shopping. CCTV footage showed her purchasing food in the store at around 12.15 p.m. While she browsed and bought what she needed, she was unaware that back home, Joel Jr. was starting to carry out his elaborate plan. He attacked his father with a knife in the exercise room on the first floor of the couple's home. Joel Sr. was so viciously assaulted that he sustained at least 40 stab wounds, and his liver, kidneys, and lungs were damaged, as well as his ribs. After the stabbing, Joel Jr. cut the clothing from his father's body and placed it near to where the murder occurred. The exercise room showed obvious signs of a struggle, including the blinds being torn and a Bowflex machine being overturned. Blood was splattered on one of the walls. When Lisa returned home from Walmart, she dropped her shopping at the front door and climbed the stairs to the first floor, where she too was fiercely attacked. She was stabbed at least 31 times. Nine of her ribs had been severed, and like her husband, afterwards her clothing was removed from her body and left next to where she was killed. Following the murders, Joel Jr. removed his father's hands at the wrists and left them on the floor of the exercise room. He then removed his mother's head, placed it in a pot, and put the pot on the stove to boil. Later, a forensic examiner would testify in court that Lisa's head had not just been cut, but broken off with force. But Joel Jr. wasn't done yet. He dismembered the bodies of his parents completely and placed their remains into a bin full of chemicals to help aid decomposition, with the hopes it would dissolve the bodies completely. Each body was later found to have had a large gash inflicted upon it after death, so the chemicals in the bin would seep into the body's main cavities more quickly. As a result of the violence, the 28-year-old had sustained wounds to both his hands, including several deep cuts. At 3.30 p.m. that day, Joel Jr. can be seen on CCTV in Walmart gathering bandages and ointment so that he could attempt to look after the wounds. However, the following day, he drove back to Baton Rouge to have the cuts treated at the student clinic. After this, he did not return to the scene of the crime. It wasn't long, however, before those close to the older couple became suspicious. Lisa's boss became concerned when she repeatedly tried to call the 55-year-old but got no answer and she never turned up to work when she was scheduled to. Subsequently, Lisa's employer alerted the authorities and asked them to perform a welfare check. Knox County police officers arrived on the scene and noticed immediately that it seemed to be empty. Strangely, although the house was for sale, there was no real estate lockbox on the front door handle. It was later determined that the doorknob had been switched with the one from the back door. 
Peering inside, investigators saw perishable groceries, which had spilled out of shopping bags. Packets of bacon and tubs of ice cream lay on the ground floor of the home, just inside the door. Most tellingly of all, however, was the odd chemical smell emanating from the house. They were able to access one of the cars in the driveway and open the garage door to get inside, where they were immediately met with an even stronger version of the chemical smell, and also a blazing heat. The home's thermostat was turned up and several small heaters were plugged in, making the building a blazing 33 degrees Celsius inside. On the table, authorities found the wallets of Joel Sr. and Lisa. A sledgehammer sat on top of them. The pot containing Lisa's head was still boiling away on the stove, although it was not yet investigated, and officers were unaware of what the pot contained at the time. Upstairs, Joel Sr.'s hands were found. Then the bodies in solution were discovered in the bathroom. Alongside this find, investigators noticed a bag of baking soda, muriatic acid, drain opener, and bottles of bleach in the home. One officer described the crime scene as, quote, the most horrific thing I've ever encountered in law enforcement in my life. In the guest bedroom, authorities uncovered the most incriminating piece of evidence of all. Inside a backpack, they recovered a notebook filled with the details of Joel Jr.'s plan to kill his parents. One of his notes read, quote, Money all mine. I get the whole thing. He was to receive $500,000 in life insurance policies if both his parents died or went missing. The 28-year-old had originally planned to stab his parents to death, dismember and dissolve their remains, clean and burn down their house, and then frame his father for the entire thing. Joel Jr. was also caught on CCTV buying the supplies he needed for the crime, and this showed that he was stocking up on the items he would need as early as November 7th. He used cash in each transaction and usually used the self-checkout option. In a hardware store in Napoleonville, he purchased muriatic acid and food-grade hydrogen peroxide. On November 18th, he was seen on surveillance footage at Home Depot buying a bleach sprayer, multiple extension cords, and a timer. And just days after that, on the 21st, he purchased a large plastic blue bin from Walmart, which was big enough for the dismembered bodies to be dissolved in. Following the discovery of the bodies and the CCTV footage of the couple's son, the FBI, Knox County Sheriff's Office, and East Baton Rouge Sheriff's Office worked together to place Joel Jr. under surveillance. On Tuesday, November 29th, he was apprehended in the parking lot of his apartment complex while trying to get into his vehicle. Officers found a meat grinder and a jerry can in the trunk of his car. Joel Jr. was charged with the murder of both of his parents. He pled not guilty to the charges, but filed a motion that he be given the death penalty should he be found guilty and convicted. His defense team reportedly presented no evidence on his behalf over the course of the four-day trial. In October of 2020, the 32-year-old was found guilty on both counts of murder and was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences. The jury deliberated for just three hours before returning their guilty verdict. Joel Sr. had three daughters from a previous marriage. They told the court that the couple were, quote, Larger than life. They were so happy. They were such really good people. And they loved him. They loved him so much. They loved all of us. For anyone to do what he did, I don't understand it. One of the daughters added that the family will never be the same after suffering such a terrible tragedy. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations. And remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon for as little as $2 each month. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.